Song Yim. Welcome to today's Sunday worship. As we begin, please bow your heads with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace that you pour on us every single day. We thank you for bringing us together as one body of Christ as we worship you today. Would you be with us as we listen to your word? And would you help us not only to listen, but also to apply your word into our everyday lives? Please be with those who are struggling either financially or physically, and please enable them to feel your presence and your guidance as you help them conquer through every kind of hardship. Would you be with us as we go through our everyday lives and would you help us glorify you in every single thing that we do? We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Oh, uh-huh. 
upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the thing so much lord we come before you in this time of worship and lord we're just so thankful that we can even gather um, online and be able to sing your praises lord at this time i pray that we would truly be reminded of the words that we just sang lord that as we turn our eyes to you that we're able to be reminded of what you have done on that cross and what you will continue to do for us we just thank you so much for all these things lord i pray that you'd be with our pastor ben as he speaks today and we just thank you for everything and in jesus name we pray Amen. Hello, New Song EM. Hope everyone is doing safe and well. Before we go into our prayer for offering, our brother Chris Kwan will show us three easy steps on how you can give your offerings online. First, go to your bank's website and sign in. Then, look for a pay or transfer button and select pay bills and add New Song Church as a payee and fill out the necessary information. Next, Enter New Song Church's info as follows. Your account number will be your last name, followed by the month of your birth, and followed by the day of your birth, as shown here. Step 3. Finally, all you have to do is set up bill pay by selecting New Song Church as the payee and enter your offering amount, and click Pay once the information is all correct. That's it. Tithing and offering are some of the ways that you can give back to God. That being said, some of you might be going through uh, financial struggles. And if you need any help or prayers, please reach out to Pastor Ben, Pastor Chen, or any of the members. At this time, let us bow our heads for the offering. Dear Father God, Lord, we just thank you so much for this Sunday afternoon that you've given us. 
Father God, I pray that you would allow to speak through Pastor Ben as he preaches your word today. And I pray that you allow us to use the scripture um, in our everyday lives and just strengthen us in everything that we do. I also pray for everyone's safety and health uh, throughout this world uh, and just continue to watch over us. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good afternoon, New Song English Ministry. We're glad that we can come together and worship as one body today. Uh, we're, uh, I kind of changed my uh, recording space a little today. Uh, if you guys can see, it's our fellowship hall. Uh, this is a place where we used to come together and fellowship and catch up and, and chat and just see how everybody's weeks were going after service. And we're really sad that we're not able to do this in person anymore. But we look forward to the day that we could do this again. Uh, we look forward to the time when we can gather together uh, and interact and share and talk and pray and be with one another as one body. Uh, so as we uh, go into this message today, I hope that uh, this will be a time where we can be hopeful, uh, looking forward um, and praying together as uh, one body for that time. As we go into the Word today, I'm going to be preaching in Matthew 24, verses 42 to 46. Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 to 46, if you guys can turn there with me. And the message, uh, the title of my message today is Be Ready. Be ready. What does that mean for us? As Christians, what does it mean to be ready? So if you guys are with me, if you guys can stand in the honor of reading God's Word, Matthew 24, 42 to 46. We're going to read this out loud together in one voice. Ready? Begin. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, as we go into your word today, as we go into this message, help us to find hope and truth in you. Help us to see uh, the glory that you have waiting for us and work in our hearts to be ready for that. Lord, we thank you for this word. Give us open hearts uh, and attentive ears to what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we start this message, uh, the, the idea of Jesus' second coming uh, actually reminds me of a famous line that you might have heard before. Well, maybe some of you guys have. It's the line, I'll be back. Of course, I don't say it the same way that Arnold Schwarzenegger did in the movie Terminator, but uh, what we have this understanding of from that line is that he indeed will be back. He ha you haven't seen the last of him. Um, with uh, that idea, it's similar to, to a cliffhanger uh, that, that, that leaves you anticipating what's to come at the end of a chapter in a book or even at the end of a TV show, maybe a Korean drama. They're really good at that. Um, or even uh, the, the end credits at the end of uh, recent popular movies that although the movie has ended, there's this idea that there's something else coming that there's something else to anticipate, to wait for. Even though the movie has ended, there's something you can hope for. The movie might have been great, but there's this idea that the story continues, that there's more to come, that there's even more anticipation and hopefulness in the next movie. It builds and builds and builds. And that's very similar to this idea of Christ's second coming, Jesus' second coming. When he was here first, there was a lot that happened. But as we see and wait for Jesus' second coming, we know and understand that there's more to come, that the second coming is better than the first. So if we know that Jesus is going to be coming again, should we not be ready? My main point, the main point of my sermon today is that Jesus' second coming is a warning to be ready and message to be hopeful for. 
Jesus' second coming is a warning to be ready and message to be hopeful for. The first point of my message is we must be ready for Jesus' second coming. We must be ready for Jesus' second coming. Jesus shares at the beginning of this, this passage here, starting in verse 36, he shares a story from the Old Testament that all of these disciples should know, and many of us would know. It's a very familiar story that reveals and kind of pours into the situation at hand. Jesus is talking about the story of Noah and the flood. And he kind of puts his disciples and shares from the context of where those people may be. Where the people, not Noah and his family, but the people around them, what kind of context, what kind of mindset they would have. And he, and he shares that they were working. They were working and minding their own business. In verse 38, it says, For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. The people were living their life. They were doing what they know. They weren't changing their lifestyle in any way. They weren't anticipating or waiting for anything, but they were simply doing. They were just living their life, their everyday life, until the flood came. Until the flood came, they weren't ready, and it swept through. Jesus continues on in this story, and he shares two situations, very short. He says, two men working, working in the field, right? Working in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Then he shares, two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. He's sharing that in every situation, in this life, there will be a moment where people will be minding their business, doing their work, but there will be a reason a reason for one being taken and one being left. Now, uh, we might look at this and say, well, the one being taken, maybe that's the bad one. Maybe, maybe the one that's staying is good. But we know and understand in the context of Jesus' second coming that the one that is being taken is the one being taken to Christ. The one being left is the one being left for God's judgment. Jesus continues on, sharing about how we don't know. We don't know when. Sharing about how we might be just minding our own business when the time of Christ comes. As one person is left and one person is taken. And he continues sharing. He shares an analogy here. In verse 43 it says, But, this, uh, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. He uses this analogy to share. That if a thief were to announce when he'll be coming, when he were to tell you what time he will be at your house to break in and take your things, you would be ready for it. Any master of the house would be ready for it. They would have stayed awake for that time. But they don't. They don't share that. Just like that. Jesus is sharing. Not that he will be taking anything from us. But he shares that, just like that situation, we must be ready. We as Christians must be ready. We don't know the time or day that they are not announcing when Jesus will come, but he will. And will we be ready? As we think about the, the, this future and when Christ will come, uh, many times we're caught uh, worrying about our life around us. We're worried about the circumstances around us. We're worried about what is going on, what is happening, what we're supposed to do. And I want to say, do not concern yourselves too much with the current times. Do not concern yourselves too much with the current times. Now, this isn't to say that you shouldn't worry at all. This isn't to say that at all. Actions such as being informed of politics and uh, political views and political stances of these politicians is important. And the current social dynamic are also important. Knowing them, knowing how to, um, uh, knowing how to understand how the world is mov moving. Because we should be standing for what is biblically correct in this world and knowing how to best connect with others. 
We do this. We understand the politics. We understand what is going on. We stay informed so that we can continue to live rightly and biblically and seek for the world to live in that way. We seek to understand the social dynamics and how the world is moving and how people are thinking, not because we want to have some sort of insight that, that helps us be better or, 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 or benefits us in the long run. But no, it's so that we can benefit them by being able to connect with them in a way that we can share the gospel. Paul is a really good example of this when he shares that he was a Jew to Jews so that he can win them over. And he was a Gentile to the Gentiles so that he can win them over. He uses the language of sharing specifically that, that he will win them over. He understands and, and shares and, and reaches people in where they are comfortable so that he can better share and direct the conversation of Christ to them. So that he can better share the gospel message to them so that they can understand. He, his main goal and priority is to win them over to Christ. And we should understand that. But one thing that we should be very clear about, one thing that in the midst of all of this, I'm trying to understand how the world is moving, and, and it goes back to my statement that I shared earlier of do not concern yourselves too much about the current times, is that we shouldn't over-worry, overly worry about the outcome of what is happening in this world. Yes, we worry, we, can, we stay concerned, we stay informed, we know what is going on, but we don't overly worry because we know, because we know the outcome. We don't worry because we know that God is in control. One thing that happens when we worry too much is that we get so focused on making sure we do what is right, we making sure that we do what is biblical in this present time to the point where we start to build hatred and division with the people that we're seeking to save, that we're seeking to win over. Yes, yes, Paul called out sin where it was necessary, but he didn't create a division between him and the people to the extent that he isn't able to share the message with them, that he isn't able to share or win them over. He still created and, and kept an avenue of conversation. He understood that God was sovereign. He understood that he was in charge and he entrusted him with the outcome. Just like that, we should leave the outcome of this world to him. We must not dwell too much on the outcome to the point where we lose sight of our mission or take actions that prevent us from our mission. We fight justice, yes we do, and stand against the sin of the world, but we do so with the focus on the mission of Christ, not in addition or not adding to, uh, not adding that with our mission for Christ. You see, there's, there's, a, there's a purpose for this. There's a very specific reason why I'm wording it this way, that we focus on the mission. We fight for justice and against sin in our mission for Christ, focusing on our mission for Christ, rather than adding the two together. We don't add justice in standing against sin to our mission of Christ. We fight against it. We fight for justice, focusing on our mission, through our mission for Christ. And the reason why this is so important is because when we're focusing ultimately on our mission for Christ and all the things we do, even as we fight justice and even as we stand against sin, it is in that focus and we take the steps to make sure that we're clear on that mission. We stand for Christ and set that example for Christ first and foremost as we stand against. Christ stood against justice, or stood for justice, and he stood against the sin of the world. So we can too, but he did it in glorifying God. Not just to make justice happen. If anything, he felt the greatest injustice as he died on the cross for our, our sins. But if we add our mission for Christ to our fight for justice, to standing against sin, if we add them, then we look at it as if, if we fulfill one goal, then we have, then the other one is a pass. Or if we fulfill one goal, at least we got one of the two. We lose sight, we split our focus, we split what our mindset is, we lose 
sight of our true intentions and purpose as lights of the world reflecting Christ on those around us. It's true, certain outcomes in this world will bother us, offend us, seem outrageous. That is true. And sin must be called out clearly so that one may repent. But if we allow the outcome to become a barrier from our ability to reach people, then we do not allow ourselves to be the tools to reach the world that God has made us to be. We don't overlook sin, but we attack it with the gospel message of grace, redemption, and love. You see, our main focus and purpose is standing for Christ. As we stand for Christ, it means we stand for justice. As we stand for Christ, it means we stand against sin. Those work one and together. As Jesus shares this message, as he tells his people to be awake, it reminds me of a story uh, of something I I did when I was younger. Um, When... We all uh, understand uh, the anticipation for the release of a new product. And I remember there was a point when the next iPhone came out. And as the next iPhone came out, uh, there was uh, this, this, this desire to get it. I had a couple friends that wanted to both get it with me. So we all went and we went to the store and we stayed and waited the night before for the store to open. We waited for the night before for the store to open so that we can have our chance, our first chance at the next iPhone. While we were sitting there, while we were waiting, hours and hours went by. We would stay awake. We tell each other, don't fall asleep. We never know when the, the store is gonna open and we're gonna have to move. We have to be ready. We have to be ready to move when the line moves. And this similar, somewhat similar way, Christ is telling his disciples to be ready. In verses 45 to 46, it says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Jesus is telling his disciples to stay awake, to be ready. And as he shares that, he's sharing about what it means to be a faithful and wise servant. And those are the people who wait. Those are the people who look forward, who continue to do the work that is entrusted to them by the master until he comes. And as they're doing the work faithfully, when the master comes home, he'll reward them and he'll bless them. He'll look favorably upon them. Hope, we see, uh, is persevering and and working in the now because we know that the end product is there. We know that the end product will come, not the current circumstances. Knowing that the current circumstances aren't the end outcome. We hope in Christ's second coming not because we're struggling right now, but because we know that when He comes, what He brings will be better than the struggles right now. That is why we stay awake. That is why we stay prepared. The second point of my sermon is that we are hopeful for Jesus' second coming. We are hopeful for Jesus' second coming. We know that that time will be better. This whole time as Jesus is... is, um, were sharing this message uh, he, he even before as he's been working in, in, in his ministry he's been alluding to a time that will come he's been sharing to the disciples that his time isn't now it's not yet it's not yet but the time will come Jesus is co- constantly pointing his disciples he's saying not now not now but, but, but it is coming the future is coming my time will come and he's pointing the disciples forward instead of just telling them to look at their current situation. He's saying, don't just look at what is now. Yes, now this is happening and this is going on, but my time is coming. It is not yet, but it is coming. He knew 
that as he pointed the disciples forward to what is to come, he knew that when they saw what will come, that their hope would be found not in the now, not as one going now, for them, as they were working and doing Jesus' ministry, it must have been tough. At the times where it was, it was difficult. They didn't have a, a place to lay their heads at all times. They didn't always have stability. But knowing that there was something to come, knowing that there was a future to come, he tells them to look forward. With that, I tell each and every one of you, look forward. Don't get stuck looking at your current circumstances that you're unable to look forward to the hope that is to come. Don't get stuck so much in looking at this current time, looking at this pandemic time, looking at your current situation of being stuck, not being able to gather together as a church body, not even able to gather together in person, not being able to go about as you please, not worrying so much about the now that you're unable to look forward and hope in what is to come. It is very sim similar to me, uh, like a situation when you're out in nature. Um, I went for a walk out in nature recently and uh, the ground was very uneven. Right? The ground was very uneven. And one thing as you, do, as, as you walk in areas where ground is uneven, one thing that you have to do is you have to make sure you know where you're stepping, right? You make sure where you know where you're stepping. But, but you can spend the whole time looking down at your feet and, and, and making sure you're standing on the right spot. But if you're outside in nature, why would you focus on your feet when you can look up and see the world around you? You see, when you walk and you try to figure out where you need, where you need to place your feet, you alternate, you look down, you make sure you know you're, you're walking on solid ground, even ground, but your focus isn't on your feet, but it's on the world around you. It's on the nature around you. It's on the creation of God around you. And in that similar way, if we focus so much on our current circumstances, focusing on making sure that our current times are stable, making sure that we are uh, completely fine right now, then we lose sight of God's work around us then we lose sight of the hope that Christ is coming in the future, then we lose sight of God's glory. We lose sight of the marvelous glory of God that came in our past, that is here in our present, and that will be coming in the future. Look forward, my friends. New song EM, let's be people that look forward trusting God, trusting that God will take care of what is here now, hoping and looking forward. God has a plan for each and every one of you. He has, he has a plan just like he did when, he, uh, when Israel was in captivity. When e Israel was taken over, he gave them, he told them that he had a plan. In Jeremiah 29, 11, he tells them that he has a plan for them. Not just a plan just to, just to, that, that works, but a plan for their prosperity, for their good. And just like he had a plan for Israel, and he never forgot them, he has a plan for each and every one of us who believes, who entrusts our lives into his hands. And not, just does, and not only does he have a plan for each and every one of us individually, but he also has a plan for this world. As we think of Christ's second coming, we understand that we are saved and we will be taken. But we must also understand that he has a plan for this world, a plan to redeem this world, to redeem his creation that was tainted by sin. You see, God's plan isn't just to patch up the areas that are broken or that have holes. He's not just patching it to make it move forward, but he's seeking to redeem it, to make it new, make it in his image and plan. You see this message here. There's a, there's a warning at the end of it. There's a warning that there'll be a time that comes for judgment. Time that comes for judgment, and then and the people that do not trust in God, that don't know Him, should be worried. But there is hope for those who do believe. There is hope for those 
that, that have been saved, that have been redeemed. Because God will not only redeem those who follow Him, not only redeem His people, but He will redeem this world for His people. That is what we see in the creation of man. God created us in His image, but sin tainted us. Through Adam to us now, we've been tainted by sin. But through Christ, He redeems. Through Christ, He, he, he makes us new, gives us a new heart. Through Christ, we are made clean. He does this by completely forgiving us of our sins when we come to believe. Not just covering up the sin, but completely forgiving our sin. The main point of my sermon was that Jesus' second coming is a warning to be ready, to be ready for what's to come, and a message to be hopeful for His second coming. Jesus' second coming is a warning to be ready, and message to be hopeful for. As we continue to live through our lives, live out this story of our lives, let us remember that the next chapter is coming. The next chapter will always be there. It is not the end yet. We may be at a cliffhanger, wondering what will happen next. What, what do we have to wait for? But God has already revealed to us the ending. We just don't know what happens in between. He has revealed to us the victory at the end that we have to look forward to. We simply need to look forward and keep moving towards it. It's as if, it's as if we would be walking through a long tunnel and walking to the light at the end of the tunnel. The tunnel might be dark and damp now where you're standing as you're walking. You may stumble, you may trip, you may fall. It may hurt in that moment. But if you keep looking forward and seeking and pursuing and striving for that light at the end of the tunnel, we know that that light will never move, that the light will always be there, and that light will be better for us. We know that the light at the end of the tunnel will be better for us than what we have now in this world. What we have now in the darkness that we see in this world. It reveals to us that the completed and redeemed work of God will be better for us than the brokenness and sinfulness of this world. That light, that end, that point, Jesus' second coming, will be perfect and holy. So let's look forward. Let's look forward together. Let's pray. Father God, uh, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this message you've given us through your word to encourage us and to also take a hold of our lives. Help us to be people who stand firm, and look forward. Help us to be a people that, that, that look around and, and worry about the things in this world for the sake of the mission of Christ, for others to come to know you, but don't get stuck in that mission. Help us to be a people who look forward and entrust this time with you. Help us to trust that all this time will be okay. Looking forward to the time ahead. Looking forward to your second coming. I won't be able to meet you again at the light at the end of the tunnel. Lord, we thank you for your grace. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.
soul to save. My lips shall still repay. Cause Jesus made it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Let's pray. Father God, as we look at this time, as we look at what, what is going on, there may be a lot of worries, a lot of things that are happening that may or may not be going the way we desire, mostly not. But in this time, in this time, let us look forward. Let us remember that there is a future, that there is a hope for us. Let us remember that there is a second coming that we can look forward to that we can keep our hope in. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for this message. Help us to be a people who are hopeful, who are joyful, who look forward, and who share that message with others. Help us to see the darkness in this world and the brokenness of the people around us and allow us to be a catalyst, a light into their lives to redeem them for Christ, to point them to God, that you can work in their lives and show them the hope that is to come. Lord, we thank you for this message today. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we... Uh, as I'm standing here in our fellowship hall, now is the time that we come together in fellowship as one. Uh, we wanted to have uh, this time to continue to uh, catch up with one another, to get to know one another more, to see how God has been working in each other's lives in this time. So uh, join us on our Zoom fellowship. Let's see you there.